Good morning. I'm Councillor Lucy Hovels, Chair of the Health and Wellbeing Board. This virtual meeting is taking place on the 11th of September 2020 and is being recorded live through the Council's website and will be available for, to be viewed for the next um, six months. I would like to give you a warm welcome to our members, officers and members of the public or media who are watching this live feed to the meeting. I would also like to welcome Faisal Jessard from the CCG's governing body, lay member, as a member of the Health and Wellbeing Board. Faisal will take up David, um, Dr David Smart, who had a seat at the board, but following his retirement. So I'm um, delighted this morning to welcome Faisal. He, you bring a lot of experience. We, I think we've all worked with you um, in the past. So we're looking forward um, to your contribution and the skills and experience that you bring to our stable, Faisal. Um, so you're very, very welcome this morning. <coughs> also, you. I'd, like, I'd like to uh, welcome the cabinet member, Angela Surtees, who has came along today to the first meeting to observe today's meeting. Angela is um, a, a colleague and she has the portfolio, important portfolio for the social inclusion agenda. And again, Angela, you're very welcome to observe today's meeting. We also have Michael, who's joined the team, Michael Lang, who's joined us today. Um, and Michael again brings a lot of wealth of experience and skills and I'm sure you're all looking forward to working with Michael. So, so with that I'll move straight on with the formal agenda. I go to item one which is apologies and absence. I'll ask Jackie Graham to provide an update please. Thanks Chair. We've got apologies from John Pierce, Sue Jakes, Jennifer Illingworth, Julie Gillen, Vicky Mitchell, Dr Stuart Finlay, Nicola Bailey and Chris Cunnington Shaw. Thank you, Jackie. Can I go on to item two, substitute members? Thanks, Chair. We've got Martin Stenton for John Pierce. We've got Levi Buckley for Julie Gillen and David Logan for Chris Cunnington Shaw. Thank you, Jackie. Item three, any declarations of interest? I haven't been notified of any declarations, but as the agenda moves on, if anyone feels they do, can you please um, let, let us know and we'll make sure it's recorded. With that, I'll move straight on to item four, which is minutes of the previous Health and Wellbeing Board meeting, which was the 14th of July. Can we agree those minutes? Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. Go straight on. Um, Andrew, can I just ask um, for an update on um, the um, health and wellbeing strategy? Andrew, can you explain um, how this was developed and provide a whole, the holding position for the year and further work which is undertaken to ensure the strategy takes into account the vision, County Durham's vision, up to 2035 and the uh, Marmot, the Marmot, 10 year review and recent NHS inequalities paper. Thank Andrea. you. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm Andrea Petty, Strategic Manager for Partnerships at Durham County Council. So as the Chair said there, um, the Board will recall that the Joint Health and Wellbeing Strategy was agreed in early March this year and there was three priority areas of starting well, living well and ageing well. The Board also agreed to undertake a review after a year to ensure that the County Durham Vision 2035, the Marmot 10-year review, and then also the recent NHS Health Inequalities paper were fully taken into account within the strategy. And in addition, obviously, since the beginning of March, we've had the global coronavirus pandemic and many of the actions that we had in the strategy have supported our wellbeing approach in these unprecedented times. The strategy refresh um, will further consider the impact of COVID-19 has had on the council partners and our communities and also any COVID related actions will be included in the new strategy so the board can accept, expect to receive the draft strategy updated in January 2021 for comment and the final version back to board in March. Thank you Chair. Thank you um, Andrea. We go on to item five, health and social care integration, which is a stand um, item on our agenda. Can I ask Jane Robinson to present the report, please? 
Thank you, Chair. Good morning. I'm Jane Robinson, the Corporate Director for Adult and Health Services at Durham County Council. Uh, Chair, just a couple of things really to update um, members of the board on since our last meeting. Uh, you'll know from previous reports our approach around integration had been around developing an integrated commissioning function. Uh, and I think we reported uh, previously that Sarah Burns had been appointed to the post of Head of Integrated Strategic Commissioning. Uh, I'm really pleased to say that Sarah started in that post um, and is progressing with the development of that integrated commissioning function, which has been really helpful uh, in supporting us through recent months. Um, secondly, Chair, you've already mentioned Michael Ling. Um, Michael joined us uh, just last week as the uh, Director of Integrated Community Services following uh, the retirement of Leslie Jevons um, in uh, July. Uh, I know uh, the board will probably want to express their thanks to Leslie for all the work that she's done in the county over the years that she's worked in County Durham uh, and wish her well in her retirement. Um, but really welcome Michael to the board um, and to the county in his new role. And Chair, if I may, I'll maybe just ask Michael to introduce himself to the board, if that's OK, uh, before we move on to the uh, commissioning plan, which is a, a really good indication of the work we've been doing collectively uh, in the next item. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joan. Michael. Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you for your warm welcome. I'm looking forward to uh, working with the board. Um, if I may, three points have struck me uh, in my first eight days. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, the commitment of partners to working together to overcome the exciting challenges we face that you mentioned, Chair. Uh, the second one is the strong focus uh, of all partners on residents, patients and service users, and everybody I've met has immediately gone to integrations about caring for uh, patients and service users. And I think finally, the concentration um, on the wider well-being of the population uh, that we serve, which is reflected in the agenda uh, of this board. Uh, so I look forward to working uh, with you, Chair, and the board members. Thank you. Thank you, um, Michael. So we are excited about you being part of the part of the team. I think it is important that uh, we note in the minutes our appreciation for all the work and um, the um, work that's been undertaken with the new agenda um, from Leslie Jevons. She um, went into that new role um, and certainly made a difference and moved things forward. And I certainly, uh, as chair of this board, enjoyed working with Leslie. She brought an awful lot of skills and experience. Obviously, she was a nurse in her previous life, so she knew this agenda very, very well. And obviously we all, I'm sure the partners around the table will miss Leslie, but uh, we certainly wish her the very best in her retirement or whatever she may uh, choose to do. Um, and now would like that recorded um, in the minutes. So with that, we'll um, go straight on with item six, which is the County Durham Place Based Commissioning Team. And uh, John, um, who was with us today, John, John Quine, is it? It is. Thank you, Chair. Um, my name is John Quine. I'm a commissioning delivery manager within the integrated commissioning team. And I'm here today to present the County Durham Place Based Commissioning and Delivery Plan 2020 to 2025. And this is the September 2020 update. Um, this is the first review of the plan since the Health and Wellbeing Board adopted this in spring um, earlier of, of, of this year. So I'm hoping that this, the plan looks very familiar to members in terms of its structure. This was a structure that was developed with the board, um, I think a good 12 months ago now. Um, so I'm hoping that the plan um, looks familiar. However, I also hope that the members can see that it has matured and developed. There were three main elements that the this update um, has, has worked through and, and we have a, a, a planning group of around about um, 13 um, colleagues from across health, social care and um, public health. And um, the, the three things that were asked to look at over the summer period were the brag rating of the initiatives. So that's looking at the initiatives um, in each of the chapters and then rating them as blue, red, amber or green, depending upon how they have been progressing since the spring. And hopefully that's nice and clear. Um, those schemes that have a long lead in time up until 24, 25 
have been less impacted by the pandemic than those which have been um, an awful lot more um, um, with a shorter time frame. So that's the BRAG rating. The second um, ask of all the chapters was to outline their recovery um, plans from COVID in the short, medium and longer term. And then the third ask over the summer was to start the development of the County Durham Outcomes Framework. Now the, the approval process and the governance um, for this iterati iteration of the plan has been comprehensive with all partners. The COVID recovery plans were considered by the Health, Welfare and Communities Recovery Support Group and their contribution in supporting chapter leads and has been absolutely key in making sure that these recovery plans are, are robust and relevant. The plan has also been approved by all partner organisation executives and partnership boards, including the Mental Health Strategic Partnership Board, the Children and Young People's Integration Board, LABB, and the Integrated Care Board. I think we feel as a planning group that the plan has now matured and is and is moving from um, what was a collection of um, organisational plans into a true system plan where all the partners really are understanding and demonstrating the dependence that they have on one another. Um, there was a, re a meeting this week and all the partners reflected that actually uh, updating the plan has really supported further system working. And key for me in this particular iteration has been the involvement of public health colleagues across every single part of the plan. So hopefully moving it more from um, an organisational service driven plan to a much more systemic view of the um, of, of what the, the plan aims to achieve. The next steps between now and the next iteration in spring 2021 is that we will maintain uh, the COVID recovery plans in response to the changing nature of the pandemic, wherever that may take us. We're going to further develop the outcomes framework led by Dr. Michael Smith, GP executive on the Integrated Care Board. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we'll be able to come back in the spring with a robust product that supports um, the um, performance monitoring of each of those chapters in a very relevant and meaningful way. That's, I, I genuinely think that's a really quite exciting piece of work. And then the, the final thing, um, and I don't want to steal cat thunder, um, but we really do need to embed the approach to well-being within the chapters. You'll see in each of the chapters there is a heading of um, the approach to well-being. We need to really push that on now. So CAT is going to support each of the chapter leads in um, developing their understanding of the approach to well-being, undertaking the self-assessment and uh, being that critical friend and that challenge so that we can uh, truly embed the approach to wellbeing and not just have it as a title. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, thank you, John. We have a question. Councillor Gunn would like to come in, Chair. Alwyn, Councillor Gunn. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, and, and thank you for that presentation. Um, I mean, I'm absolutely delighted to hear that the, the involvement of all of the partners, the crucial involvement of all of the partners, that really is, and how you are achieving this um, very robust product, product as you called it, that again is crucial. The question I have really is about how we communicate the revised plan. How do we do that? Because I think that's one of the essential um, issues around this. And, and um, I think you alluded to um, the fact that it will very likely be a live plan as things go forward. But um, where can, if it's a live plan, where can the comments be fed in to that live plan? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alwyn. John? Thank you, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, you've, you've really hit the nail on the head. This is a live plan. It's a working, living document. It's not um, a strategy, it's a response to a strategy and therefore it needs to be um, responsive in, it, in itself. And we need to note it has 22 chapters and each chapter has a chapter lead who will then coordinate with colleagues from right across the spectrum for whichever 
um, chapter that that is. Um, we are hoping that each chapter lead will um, utilize the, the, their individual OGIM as their work plan, so we'll really feed into that. So it's incumbent upon all partners to continue the conversation and that this isn't just seen as a twice yearly piece of work. I think in terms of how partners then engage with that is dependent upon each of those individual project boards. So for example, there's a chapter on diabetes, there is the diabetes board, and it is envisaged that they will own that and that OGIM, that chapter, will um, constantly be updated to reflect that. I think there is a recognition that certain partnership boards are much more mature than others, and there is an absence of um, strong governance in certain areas, but there is excellent governance elsewhere. So we want to raise the bar with all of them, and we hope that the plan will be the means by which that occurs. I do, however, think that there is an issue about how we communicate this to our um, residents and patients service users, because it is a it is quite a dry document. It is an it is an internal planning document that um, is geared to bring people together who are delivering services, and we need to mature it into how we communicate it to those in receipt of services and also seek their views in order to influence it. Now, I understand that that will be occurring at an individual chapter level, depending upon how people engage with their public. However, um, I have a meeting next week with Paul Goodwin from Durham County Council and Daniel Blackton from the CCG, who are our um, communications and engagement leads, in order to understand how we can not just put the um, the plan on individual partner websites, but how do we then seek uh, feedback from that? So it's an it's a, an area that I hope I will be held to account for in the spring when I hopefully return and um, I'll be able to then demonstrate that we have uh, undergone through that um, engagement um, process. Thank you. Thank you, John. Any other members have any questions? If not, can we agree the recommendation that the board will be asked to approve the, the um, County Durham uh, based commission and delivery plan for 2020 to 2025 and have an update in September? We agree, agree those recommendations? Great. So we move on to item seven, which is the send inspection update action plan. And I believe, Martin, you're going to um, take us through this report. Yes, good morning, everyone. I'm Martin Stenton from Children's Services. I also chair the SEND partnership in County Durham. Uh, so this report covers the progress we've made as the local partnership since the original SEND inspection in late 2017. Um, the revisit took place in January this year and the letter was published in March. It did show that sufficient progress have been made across all the four written statements of action areas, which we were really pleased about. Um, the letter highlights a number of areas of positive progress and a number of these are highlighted in paragraph 18 of the report and also shows some areas where further work is needed and those are highlighted at paragraph 21. There's also a copy of the full inspection letter attached as an appendix to the report. Um, the document now on screen is a copy of the action plan which we've put together in recent months, obviously a challenging time for everyone, but we have continued to work as a partnership and meet virtually over the last six months. And we have put this action plan together with a number of key actions for us to progress over the next six to nine months. Um, we have really within it though, tried to take account of the current situation with the coronavirus outbreak and the disruption that's had on children and young people's learning and their access to a number of services. So we're trying still to support that recovery, but actually progress some, some agreed partnership actions as well. Um, so that's the main um, focus of the, the action plan over the next six to nine months. Report also does note that uh, we had a really nice positive letter from Vicky Ford MP, um, the relevant minister, um, who, who was congratulating us really on the progress that we've made as a partnership um, with our SEND work over the last two years. So um, we received that a month or two ago, and that's really, really pleasing to hear as well, as we do know that there's the continued government interest in, in this agenda, which is uh, right and appropriate as well. 
Um, so those are the main points uh, of the report and I just referred to the action plan there. Happy to uh, take further questions on it. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. And uh, I hope we um, get some good publicity around the uh, the letter that we've re received. Um, um, I'm, I'm sure, sure you, you will. Um, I have got some questions. Um, I've got Joy with a question in Alwyn. Do you want to take... Um, do you want to take uh, Joyce's question first, please? Thanks, Lucy. Um, thank you, Martin. Uh, can you please explain more about the future developments that are planned in relation to supporting young people with special education needs and disabilities? Thank, thank you, Joy. So I think the first thing to say that supporting children back into their learning after a considerable break is, is our sort of top priority still. I think that's the case um, across the partnership. We put together a document that's called Return to School Safe, Happy and Settled, um, which we are updating very regularly. Uh, and that's been circulated to all education providers uh, and provides lots of information on how we can support that. We, we do know that a lot of children uh, and young people um, uh, are anxious about going back to school or have issues that are, are causing difficulties with their return to school. So I think that's our, our sort of top priority at the moment. Um, Beyond that, the action plan then does cover a number of areas we've agreed to the partnership to look at over the next six to, month, six to nine months or so. Um, so there are some important further developments we want to make in terms of communications, uh, things like further updates to our local offer website so that children and families have access to the right information to help them with uh, the needs of, of their children. Um, we've got a work programme set out for our designated clinical officer, uh, who's now part of the inter integrated commissioning team because um, we really want to focus more on, on improvements to, to health advice and health input for children who've got um, EHCPs. Uh, and we've got further developments that we're looking to, to make in our neural developmental services. So those, those are some examples um, of some of the sort of more practical things we want to do um, over coming months. We are also starting work on updating our, our full SEND strategy again. Uh, and there's quite a bit of work to do on this over the next six months or so. And um, so we can get to a point of, of developing a strategy and taking it through the partnership and then ultimately bringing it to, to this board as well. Uh, and as part of that, we want to do some further engagement activities with uh, with children and families as we um, take account of, of their views and their needs to help us to, to build up um, the strategy. Um, I think the other thing to mention is the ongoing work we're doing regarding the funding for SEND and, and the work on the high needs block. And I know that cabinet members and some others who are part of this board uh, will be fully aware of the issues we've had in Durham regarding the sustainability of, of funding through the high needs block. So um, there's quite a lot of work attached to that as well to try and make that as sustainable as it can be within the resources that we have available to us, um, but also further work in terms of lobbying the government to try and improve the funding for SEND. And Councillor Gunn may, might want to refer to this herself, but she recently wrote again and to the Secretary of State regarding the funding for, for children and young people uh, who've got high needs. Thanks, Martin, for a very comprehensive answer. Appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joy, and thank you, Martin. I'll go to Councillor Gunn with your question, please. Thank you, Lucy, and I <coughs> apologise that I didn't introduce myself um, with the first question, but I'm um, Councillor Alwyn Gunn and I have the portfolio for children and young people's services and adult learning and skills. Um, I just wanted to add a little bit to what Martin said, Chair. <clears throat> um, as, as he said, I have written on behalf of the Council to the Secretary of State for Education asking for greater funding for, for this uh, area, which is absolutely crucial to us. I did write to the Secretary of State in March highlighting the pressures on the funding for children and young people with special educational needs and disability and, and also support for those pupils who are at risk of exclusion. Um, there has been a little bit of funding um, put in by the government, I have to say that, but um, quite simply it, it's, it's not enough. Um, and this is a national issue. In the financial year 2019-20, the council had to spend £8.6 million more than it received from government in the high needs block allocation. And the council actually put in £5.6 million from its reserves at that point, 
but the remaining three million had to go into the accumulated deficit which will be 5.7 million by the end of March next year. Um, that's not sustainable. And um, so this, as I said, is a national issue. And our letter very clearly asks that the government give urgent consideration to these issues, but also what we're calling for. And I think partners would want to be aware of this. We're calling for a planned national review of SEND funding because we cannot continue to keep looking at a black hole uh, year after year after year. And, uh, and I will stress again, this is not a County Durham issue alone. This is a national issue um, and um, we need to address it. Um, for the sake of, of all of our young children um, and young people who um, have special educational needs and disabilities and their families who are also feeling the pressure of actually fighting to get what they think is the right approach to education for their children. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Alwyn. Um, and obviously, if um, people around the table, any partners can um, add to, to the letter that's been sent and from their organisation have put any weight on, that would be really useful um, in terms of the lobbying that um, you do and, and on, on behalf of everybody. So we, we thank you for that. And um, we got two things to do um, in terms of the recommendations. Um, it's to note the project the progress which is being made across um, and also note the update provided in relation to the send revisit the published outcomes letter and the work outlined on the next steps being done with partners through the send partnership um, so if we could agree them to um, note them to recommendations i'll move the agenda on to um, item eight and go to health watch county durham and we've got a verbal report from David um, this morning. David, can I hand over to you? Yes, thank you, Chair. My name is David Logan. I'm the project lead for Health Watch County Durham. I'm, I'm here in uh, place of my chair, Chris. Um, and before I go into the report, I just want to put on record that the work we achieved was due to the professional dedication of the staff that I only took over this in December last year, so none of this is my, I'll take credit for it, but it's none of it's mine. <laughs> and uh, this professional staff and the work, uh, passion and energy of our chair, he is amazing for us. It makes my life a lot easier. Okay. That's it, let's go into the report. The report recovers the work up until March 2020. That, that year was a very successful year for Health Watch County Durham. We achieved our goals of the contract. Um, we reached out um, and published a lot of reports, it engaged with a lot of people. And as far as the contracts concerned, it was very good, but essentially we had created a very good network of volunteers and support. Uh, key things to note were our 19 reports, we were due to do nine, we've done 19. Those, those are good um, achievements and we have really worked they have really worked their socks off. I can't say we, they have really worked their socks off. We did a great job. Um, unfortunately, two things, key things in the, in the year was the renewal of the contract, which was due in December. It took a little while, which caused a little bit distress and uncomf um, uncomfortable for the staff um, and a little bit of a hiatus at right the wrong time. Um, it was dragged on, but we, we got through it. That's fine. And then just to come out of that and when your work futures on a five year, two plus one move on, and we're all right, this is good. COVID hits and we stop. Uh, it, it really has impact on, on us. Um, we were due to put our work plan together in the, at the beginning of the year, we had priorities listed. It was felt and um, that the impact of COVID was gonna skew anything. So we held them back and we've gone out now. Um, and I believe the, the board have all been sent uh, the link to the survey that's currently ongoing. We, due, we were due to close on the 18th of September. We put it back a week. We just had a press release go out yesterday. A um, couple of things to note on that. It's an online survey, but we we have uh, received some paper, distributed and received paper copies, but we're offering a telephone 
um, support system so we can get people phone up and we'll fill the answers in for them now. That's why we put it back a week. We've got uh, we've had some requests for that, so we're publicising that a little bit more. So I did digress from our uh, report there. Sorry. Um, where am I? Right. Work plan uh, delivered for next year. We've got the priorities coming up. We'll be feeding them back to the board once we know what they are. Close on the 25th of September. We are in a di well, no. We're in the same position as everybody else, but it is difficult for us. We have um, a network of uh, volunteer, community volunteers. We have, we're looking to the future, trying to look, seek guidance from Healthwatch England, other partners, and every one of us are in the same position that we're trying different ways to make our um, job effective. We can. We can sit in our office, we can say we are reaching out, but we do, we're not reaching to everyone and we need to challenge ourselves to do more. Um, in conclusion, the work we have done has surpassed our, our contractual obligations. It had, from me taking over, I think they've done an excellent job and we are, we were doing, a, we were on track to be very, very good. We were, we are, we are very good. That's not understanding. Where we stand at the moment is we're trying to go out now. We're trying to emerge from COVID. I wrote this with a, a view of we're emerging from COVID and then this week changes a few things. We are, it doesn't matter. We still have to go forward. We still have to try and reach out to the community because there are issues coming across our desk all the time um, related to the changes in service provision. Do I have all the answers? No, but we're going to try different things. Um, we need we need to be working with our partners. I had uh, we had a board meeting on Wednesday and we had a representative of, the, of one of the AAPs there. We need to expand that concept. We had a meet. I had a meeting yesterday with um, Daniel Blackton, communications engagement for the CCG, looking at how we can work together, how we can be part of an engagement process going forward. So that our message is is out there. We've got we've got to think outside the box because we're um, we've done some good things, but we're limited in what our capacity as a team and uh, our technical backup. We know what I know, and 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 I'm not a great IT person, so I don't know. Social media passes me by. We have some people in the team who're good at it, but we need to be better. Um, we've had some stunning examples over um, COVID. Um, you'll know we do enter in views. We have acted as a conduit for care homes to feed in from, uh, concerns into the council through our commissioner. We have um, our volunteers are working as ambassadors in the local communities. They've actually become a little bit more IT savvy. We have fortnightly Zoom meetings with our um, volunteers, our boards meeting. I think we've had six meetings, virtual meetings, and they are um, fun. Fun. People are getting used to Zoom, um, but we'll try everything and anything from we're, we're thinking with local newsletters. We put our own newsletters out. We just need to try more of the basics than just um, sit and wait. So uh, thank you for my your time. Thank, thank you, David. And you said you had one of the AAP coordinators um, at, at um, Health Watch. It may be useful to, outside of the meeting to have a conversation with Gordon, um, yeah. who, who's the lead for the AAPs, and yeah. then it would come and, and it would um, go across them all for you and save a lot of time and work for you. So if I could leave that with you. Um, thank you. Thank which you. might be helpful and obviously um, the, the partners around, around the table, I'm sure uh, um, it'll, it'll be contacting you and using some of their vehicles because it's not yeah. about um, just what you've got, it's what other partners uh, and how they can put the message out as well. So um, yeah. that was quite interesting, um, David. That, thank you. I've got a um, question from Alwyn, Councillor Gunn. Thank you, Chair. Well, um, my question, I think you've answered it actually, but um, my question was about how you were going to be adapting um, your working practices given the restrictions around COVID. I think you've 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 answered that in that you will try anything. So I, I think um, and, and that's a good answer 
to me oh. um, because I think we all have to try everything. And I know that you being a community based organisation out there in the community um, must have been really difficult for you to, to actually find ways of adapting to to keep that going. Um, and I, I'll just say, I don't think there's anything wrong with you saying you're good. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and I will add that I think you're good. Um, and, and I've actually seen quite a few of social media things as well, which, um, which I share and like. I noticed, and, I, yeah. and I think that that's a, a good way forward because mm -hmm. it does actually get to a very large percentage. I mean, I'm, I'm not, you know, your IT expert on social media by any means, but I think that that's a way forward. And there's probably lots of opportunities when you talk to Gordon, as Lucy suggested, um, in looking at how that could be actually expanded. But I just want to thank you and, and your volunteers. And, uh, and and yes, you are good. Can I just come back, Chair? Yes, um, David. There is just, and, I, and, I, and it may not be for here, but we did attend a Health Watch England how can we engage going forward? And maybe it's because of my age, maybe it's just something, but they came up with, check your local news letters, use your community center, use your church, and a whole list of things that used to be done that we always did. And this was supposedly novel new ways of working. And I scratched my head and thought, we do that. We've got to, you've surely got to do that. That's not, that's not novel and new. Um, so. I was a little bit disappointed that this was their new way of thinking, uh, but so be it. We are, we will try anything. And to be fair, we've got to engage with our partners because I've got six members of staff, most of them part time. I can't get around. Um, and I'm not begging for more money because we do a good job with what we've got. What we need to do is work together and um, put a message out. Think outside the box where I can talk to people. Um, and the link with uh, was it Gordon at the AAP? We re I, I should catch up with him. I haven't met him, I haven't spoken for a while. Yeah, yeah, and I'm happy to have a chat with you, uh, David, because a lot of things spring to my mind from, from what you've just said. So I, I'm sure if we could organize something outside I'll of this meeting, it might be quite useful. So we'll organize that. I'm sure uh, Andrea will help facilitate that. Do we have any more questions from any members? Uh, Dr. Jonathan Smith would like to come in, Chair. John Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Uh, very similar to Olwyn, really. Not so much a question, but more a expression of thanks and gratitude, really, for all the hard and ever so important work, you know, engaging with patients and getting to the heart of their concerns as well. Uh, as a GP, I was particularly pleased reading the report, uh, looking at the very positive changes that the entry and view visits have brought about, such as improved parking for patients, more nurse practitioners and so on. So yes, you know, it's a particularly difficult time, but you, you're doing a great job. Keep up the good work and, you know, thank you to all your staff, the volunteers and Chris Cunnington Shaw as well. Thanks very much. Thank you, you Jonathan. Chair, Dave, do you want to come back? Just one thing, Chair, just and it's it's, it's important. Um, our enter and view is not well it is a critical friend that's that's true but it's in a positive way um when we are slightly different to other interim views who go into critique and yes we do but we come up with recommendations solutions. rather than challenges we are, we want to be a solution not a not a problems finder it's and, and that has been positive in our in the acceptance of our interim view reports Thank, thank you, David. No other questions. Can we agree the recommendations? And can I move on to item nine, which is the health impact assessment? And Jane Sunter this morning. Morning, colleagues. Um, yes, my name is Jane Sunter. I'm strategic manager within the public health department at Durham County Council, and I'm here today to present to you um, a report on the health impact assessment that's been done on health inequalities during COVID-19. I think there's a wide recognition that, you know, inequalities will be will increase as the pandemic um, moves forward, um, both indirectly and directly. Um, and this piece of work was actually undertaken on behalf of the Health, Wellbeing and Communities Group as part of the uh, recovery cell for County Durham and Darlington. 
Um, it actually, the report itself provides a snapshot of the current state. Um, but I have to say that the, the report itself, the, the, the assessment that was undertaken was not necessarily about the virus, but actually about the impact of lockdown. Obviously, we've lifted out of lockdown um, and things of, you know, uh, the evidence base has moved on and we've learned more things. But I think certainly the, the priority areas that have come from the report and the subsequent recommendations still remain extremely relevant uh, to us all taking part in helping to reduce inequalities across County Durham. The health impact assessment itself, it's a five stage process. It's, it's, it's a technical process that we have to uh, undertake. It involves screening a number of policy areas um, for the impact on any particular um, area of work and looking to identify those health impacts. This includes uh, a literature review, um, and of course, as you can imagine, on this massive agenda, really, there was so many things that we needed to look at that would, you know, impact on um, inequalities uh, during COVID. Um, so part of the process as well is also about prioritising those impacts and actually looking at um, kind of fun funneling down to make things tangible for partners to be able to take forward um, and, uh, you know, in a practical way. The Health impact assessment process also helps us to analyse the data that is um, relevant to um, the, the impacts of COVID during lockdown and that then leads us on to be able to make um, recommendations um, which again can be taken forward by many partners. I think it's really important to say that the areas of the policy that you can see in the report that are screened out remain significant and are being maintained and governed by other areas of other partnership arrangements. Uh, good examples of this uh, have, been, have been the five year system plan that John's just highlighted to us today. Um, very much around integrating inequalities into those each each one of those plans. Um, and also recent work that's been taken um, in regard to dom domestic abuse through the DASFEG, that's the D Domestic Abuse and Sexual Violence Executive Group. So it's not, if things weren't screened in, it doesn't mean to say the relevance of other um, areas of work haven't been uh, maintained. So while the agenda is vast, we managed to um, funnel down into four key priority areas that we feel that are the most important to take forward at this point in time. They are looking at the socioeconomic impacts of the virus um, through the poverty reduction lens, um, also health, uh, mental health and well-being um, under the auspices of the Mental Health Strategic Partnership. We felt there was a, a role really around the connectivity around community assets and community networks and how that is actually um, factored in across the system um, and that more work is undertaken to identify those, those assets. And then also a fourth area is a kind of um, an interwoven golden thread really around inclusion. Um, and that's for the sort of the vulnerable groups and those who are um, disenfranchised from our uh, usual society. So the ask of the partners, sorry, we've also made recommendations within the report and um, which will be turned into an action plan again, which will enable us to actually um, monitor the outcomes. And this will be over a 12, 24 and 36 month period. So the ask of partners from the health impact assessment, it was it was a really big report, <laughs> about 90 pages. So we have distilled that down into the executive summary that you have with uh, um, for the for the board today. And um, but if people do want to have the the larger report, that's not a problem at all. Um, but we are asking really for partners to identify their contribution to reducing inequalities, linked specifically to the four key priority areas that we've. Um, that we've distilled, also to identify actions around mitigating the negative impacts of, of the pandemic. But actually, and I hope that comes out in the report, that we also want to build on the positives as well. I think there were a lot of positives looking at the evidence base and the sort of consultation process with local communities, especially children and young people that we did. Um, we also want to um, integrate, obviously, the inequalities agenda into everybody's plans, you know, action plans, policy areas um, and get partners as well to contribute to the recommendations that will be um, part of the, the ongoing action plan. Also to enable us to be able to monitor the data, as I've mentioned, and again, build on the learning. 
So it was a it was a big piece of work. It was probably of its time. It remains very relevant. Again, as John said and other partners have said about live documents, I think it's the same for this one. Um, and I think it just gives something people something tangible to be able to you know, understand what the wider determinants of health are and how they can make a, a contribution to reducing inequalities. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. Um, quite a number of recommendations there. I think there's five. Are we happy to agree then, um, recommendations? Then I'll take some questions, but just so for formal for the minute. So could we move them, recommendations? And then I'll go straight on to questions. I do believe we have some questions. Joy? Thanks, Lucy. Um, as Cabinet Member for Transformation, Culture and Tourism, uh, Jane will know how much work we've done internally about modern and innovative ways of working. Um, what I'd like to know is, can you provide some further clarification on how the vulnerable and marginalised groups will be identified and how this targeted work will be undertaken given the current pandemic restrictions that, as we've heard from Dave, is quite challenging, but there's ways and means of um, overcoming the barriers that have, that's placed on us. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so as part of the health impact assessment process, what we've actually done is we've utilised um, the um, NHS data that came down to us in the setup of the um, community hub during the beginning of the pandemic. Um, NHS did a drip feed um, almost on a daily basis, really looking at those most vulnerable within our society and those within the shielded population. So what we've done is we've actually used that data, but also um, looked further into our sort of uh, public health intelligence work that we do to actually collate a number of data sets um, for each area action partnership. So each area action partnership has been um, given a set of data um, that is basically sort of summarised within um, the infogram that's part of that report. So there were 14 of those and behind the infogram, um, the area action partnerships have also been given specific data sets to look at, you know, areas of disability, um, who in their area um, is part of a BAME community, including Gypsy Roma travellers, um, looking at um, uh, vulnerabilities per se. Um, so that's been given to area action partnerships. It's also been disseminated to wider partners, including the community voluntary sector as well. Um, and what that will do is it helps certainly the AEPs to actually plan where they think their priorities should be in terms of their funding opportunities. So again, there's been significant funding that's come down through the, the AEPs um, to local community and voluntary sectors, but it actually helps them sort of identify and provide an audit trail for them where that spend goes really. And in terms of being able to engage, um, you know, the, again, the vulnerable and shielded communities, um, that is very much similar to what's already been expressed really in terms of the, the innovation of, um, you know, very much you utilising, um, you know, online mechanisms, surveys. Um, but I think also as well, I just always have a caveat for that, that actually not everybody can access IT provision. And again, that's an inequality in itself, I suppose. Um, so it's very much around being able to enable others to do uh, take this work forward, really, um, in, in the mechanisms that they find their delivery at the local level. Does that answer the question? Thanks, Jane. That's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Thanks, Jane, and thanks, Joy. I think we've got a question from Levi. Is there a question from Le Levi Buckley? Yes. Uh, th thank you, uh, Councillor Hobbles. Um, so I'm Levi Buckley, Chief Operating Officer, North Tees and Heart of the Pool Foundation Trust. So, Jane, just to uh, thank you and the team, I think it's a very comprehensive report, um, obviously very timely, and as you say, although lockdown is theoretically reduced, those challenges still remain. So um, Council Hobbles, just two points really. This absolutely aligns with the Trust's approach to population health and the uh, letter we received at the end of July from NHS England in terms of the phase three recovery obviously requires providers to put a particular focus on ensuring that we are targeting hard to reach and marginalised communities so <coughs> in terms of our prevention work, but also people on waiting lists where we think there could be additional risks. We continue to work primarily with the uh, primary care networks, but Jane, I will um, link you outside of the meeting with uh, 
the director who covers um, these services so we can make sure we align. And then secondly, your uh, one of your final points around access to information technology. Similarly, we've identified that as a risk. We've seen a significant increase in virtual consultations, particularly for uh, outpatient appointments, which has been very beneficial. However, we're aware again, some of the marginalised communities have reduced access. So um, <laughs> we are exploring how we um, maximise the roles of hub and Peter Lee Community Hospital being a good example whereby we can both create a virtual consultation suite that patients can access to engage with consultants and teams, but piggyback on the back of that linking to information technology training skills to skill communities up more widely. So I really welcome the report and I'll, I'll say, uh, Councillor Hobbles, I'll take this offline to link with Jane and see how the Trust can support the recommendations in the report. Thanks, Levi. Thanks for that. Really useful. Um, I'll do you have another question from Richard? Uh, it was more just a uh, higher Richard Cheery Operational Director with um, Harrogate District Foundation, just a response to how we um, identify uh, a vulnerability. I think what's it sort of builds on what Levi has been saying throughout COVID, we've um, maintained contact with families predominantly virtually. However, even during that period of time, we've always had with appropriate use of PPE face to face with with more vulnerable families. We've been building in welfare checks and as we start to recover, then we're really enhancing the areas around emotional health and well-being. So I think anything that we're delivering, we're absolutely trying to identify the most vulnerable and ensuring that we either that we we begin to see them face to face. So, um, but the four areas are absolutely are the areas we need to be com committed to. Um, so yeah, excellent report. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Richard. Um, thanks, Jane. I'm sure we're. Um, from the chair, we'd like to thank you as well for for all the work that's been done. But um, um, in in moving forward, um, and thanks for the comments from the uh, partners. Uh, moving on to item ten, which is County Durham's approach to wellbeing um, case study. We've got Kat Miller with us this morning. Morning, Kat. Good morning. Thank you, Chair. Um, morning, everybody. Um, my name is Kat Miller and I am the Approach to Wellbeing Programme Manager. I'm here today to give you an update as to how we've been using the Approach to Wellbeing, particularly in relation to the COVID response and what the plans are moving forward. Um, I came into post on the 9th of March and then um, we quite quickly went into lockdown after that. So the um, implementation of the programme has probably taken a slightly different turn than we envisaged um, when we first looked at the project plan and how it was going to go. Um, however, I think there's some real positives that have come out of the um, response to COVID and in relation to how we use the model that we see there um, is the sound bites version of the approach. This is the um, version of the approach that we've now agreed um, from the steering group that we're going to adopt and work towards um, across all sectors. This will be the um, version of the model that's seen in any publicity um, and that's used in reports and being referenced to. What we found was the original version of the model was quite complex um, and it was quite difficult for people to interpret um, and it wasn't really fit for purpose across all the sectors. Whereas the simplified version of the model, um, people understand the language, they understand the terminology and it doesn't look complex. However, the old version of the model will sit behind um, this one as a theoretical version of it. During the um, COVID response, um, we used the approach to wellbeing quite comprehensively during the um, development of the community hubs. Um, we used it to reflect on how we were developing, where we were moving and what we needed to do next to ensure that the approach was actually embedded in the service delivery. One of the things to recognise is that um, the community hubs version was a response to a pandemic. So in terms of an evidence base and sort of using what works, we didn't really know. However, um, the principles were used to actually um, help us reflect on that and make sure that we were taking that into consideration as things went forward. Um, I've, on the presentation, I've broken it down into sort of um, some very key points. The initial um, 
self-assessment framework from the hub was around um, 25 pages long. So this is just a sort of summary of the key points and how we um, use the um, principles there. So under empowering communities, one of the things that I think has been really positive is around how we use community assets, how we were able to signpost to VCS organisations and how Locate was used and updated to make it um, recognisable for the public to use if they wanted to um, be able to seek and look for help themselves, but also for staff through the hub. It also helped develop those really good um, connections between communities and between organisations, but it was doing things with people and not to them by giving them the tools they needed to seek the support around themselves. Um, and we were encouraging people to make those connections themselves to help them build their resilience and to know where to go next time if they needed any further support. And one of the things that was also looked at was the fact that rather than just dealing with the need at that moment in time, taking that holistic approach with people and thinking, why are they presenting with this issue? What's going on around the person that's causing them to present with this? Because some of the learning that was seen was that people would keep coming back weekly, fortnightly, monthly with the same issue. So by adapting how the um, call handlers were responding to people, it was giving them that empowerment and helping them go away and think, right, this is the support we need to put around the person in order to help them not need to come back to us again and in turn increasing their resilience. We really saw through the um, whole response to the pandemic um, the absolutely fantastic assets that we do have in County Durham in response to um, the groups that were set up quite quickly, existing groups that adapted, changed and put things in place to support their communities. Um, and by again, by the community hub gathering those information and update locate, it was helping to identify right down to a community based postcode level for people what assets they did have in their community. And if there wasn't those assets, we were able to flag to the AAPs around funding that we've identified in, um, for example, one of the issues we had was in Ferry Hill around food provision. We were able to flag that to the AAP and they were able to look at how they could target funding to be able to put that community based asset in place. Um, Building resilience, so the main aim was to build resilience in people, in individuals, but also um, to build resilience within communities as well. And again, target funding into developing and understanding what is it that particular community needs, as well as us understanding what it is that individuals also needed. One of the things, again, that I think really shone through, and I hope this is something that continues long after the pandemic, and certainly for helping me establish in my role, working better together across the sectors, being able to make those connections, being able to link organisations together, um, and also being able to um, understand the roles and, and what other people do. And I think that that's something that should really be celebrated, is how we've seen people come together um, in, in terms of the response. And I think what we have seen is that people have really come together to address um, the needs for the people who have the least resilience and who have the least personal resource. And it's been really nice to see some of the success stories that have come out from being able to support people there. And it also helps that engagement, the, the co-production and also part of the um, County Durham's vision, or the County Durham's vision's aims around connected communities. That's what we've tried to aim to do. Helping people share decision making, this was slightly limited and I think this is one of the great things about the approach to wellbeing is that you can see some really good examples of good practice but what also identifies as areas that we could do better and things that we want to achieve. It's an ongoing way of working, we're never going to reach um, that full potential at any sorry one time. Interrupt everybody, sorry Kat, um, if we can just hang on just two seconds, we seem to be having some technical problems oh, and the live feed doesn't seem to be um, to be working.
Thank you. Um, so yeah, one of the things that we identified was that sharing decision making was something that was quite difficult, but in terms of engaging with communities, lots of the feedback that was given and taken through the calls has been again used in the further development of the standard operating procedures for the hub, which is then going to feed into the um, outbreak control plan moving forward. Um, I think one of the things again that we really tried to um, really tried to focus on moving forward through the pandemic was about the doing it with and not to people about helping people build the resilience and then but also upskilling and um, the call handlers and the members of staff who were redeployed to work in the community hub. really sorry to interrupt again sorry Kat it, it, the live feed just doesn't seem to be working
And if I could just welcome everybody back, can I go straight in? Um, back to you, Kat, to um, complete this report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, one of the main learnings that have come from the hub is around how well the approach works if it's embedded in service delivery. It shouldn't be seen as a separate approach. What it needs to be seen as, as a culture change, a system wide way of working that considers well-being in everything that we do. So at the last um, Health and Wellbeing Board, Denise Elliott spoke about the work that's being done with commissioning around embedding the approach into the commissioning process. And that itself has moved on quite rapidly since, um, sorry, not the last meeting, the meeting in March. Um, since March has moved on quite rapidly, um, Project Alliance um, is moving forward with the all of the outcomes that have been suggested are underpinned by the wellbeing principles to ensure that it's embedded in service delivery with that model. Um, we're looking at um, how the principles are embedded in all tender processes so that um, providers have to tell us how they're going to meet the principles as part of the tender process and then it'll be evaluated annually as part of their contract monitoring to tell us what they've done and then what their commitments are for the following year. Um, and we're also looking at how we can um, embed this cross approach across the joint commissioning service as well so trying to involve some of the health contracts and we've identified um, some initially to start working with and as John alluded to in his presentation um, all of the chapters that are within the um, Durham um, sorry I've lost my train of thought between the Durham place based commission <laughs> plan um, that all of the chapters have had to identify outcomes and um, that sit under the approach to well-being and I'll be working with all the providers to look at um, where they are with things and what how they can use the self-assessment framework and the model to develop their service delivery moving forward so it's integrating the approach into how we work. Um, there's lots of other plans moving forward. The evaluation's picking up pace. We've got our first focus group meeting last, uh, sorry, next Friday um, to start gathering information and feedback with the researchers around how providers both internally and externally have found use in the approach. Um, we're going to be looking at how we can use the approach with community buildings, which I think is going to be really um, quite positive in the response to recovery from COVID as well in how people are going to have to adapt and change the way they work how we're going to prepare the VCS for Project Alliance, how we're going to engage with communities in everything that we do, given that we're trying to do everything virtually as well, but that can exclude quite a lot of the hard to reach groups as it is. So there's quite a lot of thought and consideration needs to go into how we do that and how we do that well and how we reach those groups that are hard to reach and um, when we can't actually go out and meet with people face to face. Um, and then obviously um, how the approach is going to underpin the COVID re response in terms of the outbreak control and some of the community champions work. Um, one of the things I also wanted to um, say as well is that in terms of in the future, like we've alluded to, the approach shouldn't be seen as something separate that we do. It should just be part of how we deliver services and embedded in service delivery. So rather than um, coming along and making presentations in this way around case studies and updates, that in future where people are delivering services and using the approach and the way they work, that that's incorporated within the reports and the presentations that they come to give to the board, which will really bring to life how the approach works and seen it as a way of working rather than something separately that we're doing. Thank you, Chair. Thank Thanks, you. Kat. Kat, a very comprehensive report and obviously we want to make this our day-to-day -day core business, don't we? So um, if we can have agreement from the board that, um, that the presentation, the, the it's done as part of that ongoing work and it doesn't stand alone it's incorporated with all the reports um that come before the board if we have that agreement that will really move us forward so can we agree that please got some agreement there so yep. can we move, move on with item 11 which is health and well-being board campaigns amanda healy please thank you lucy just double checking them off mute yeah um, morning everyone. As ever, um, we know that the Health and Wellbeing Board have been the real kind of champions in terms of flu um, and we do have our uh, flu board well established now in County Durham which is co-chaired between um, one of the medical directors from the CCG and the consultants in public health um, which I think has given it um, considerable strength at a, at a local level. Um, I think also we know this year that it's going to be really important to protect those who are at risk 
from the flu and um, because obviously we do have COVID circulating in our community and I'll come on to that in the, in the next uh, report chair. So and also that people who are most at risk from COVID um, are also those who are risk of complications from, from flu. So we really do want to have a, a strengthened um, flu campaign this year with all the challenges that brings in terms of the delivery um, of, of the flu vaccination programmes. And I'm thinking of people like Jonathan in his practice at the moment, thinking about the delivery um, to, to patients um, uh, in, in, in the current circumstances. Um, and we obviously know that vaccination is the best way to protect against flu. This year, we have more people who are eligible for flu vaccination, um, and that includes the households of our shielded population, and also an extension um, of the young, um, the children and young persons vaccination program to include year seven. Um, so it's good that our schools are, are, are back up and running as well. Um, we really want to encourage the uptake within our eligible groups. We had a real push last year on those with a range of, of health conditions. Um, and I think we also saw a um, real push within the, the children. So in relation to you know our children aged 2 to 11, our 65s and over, our, uh, those um, uh, the six months and under 65 clinical at risk groups, um, pregnant women, carers you know we really really need to ens ensure that we can encourage and support carers to access flu vaccination um, household contracts have shielded um, and people that stay in long um, re term residential care um, which is obviously the um, a real issue in terms of our ongoing work with our with our care homes um, and obviously a real push for our staff um, across health and social care. So residential, nursing, um, domiciliary care, person assistance, and certainly the Durham County Council staff. We know that 50 to 64 year olds are also potentially going to become eligible um, later in the, and slightly later in the flu season. Um, I think traditionally, and, and, and sadly it's no different this year, we, we tend to find that the flu um, vaccination programme has started and then we receive materials um, and we still at this point haven't received national materials. So across the region this, this year, there's been a drive and a development of, of regional materials that, that you will see in, in the pack um, of, of, of materials that, that you have um, as part of the reports pack. So there is a regional campaign which is, has been launched during September. Um, through the integrated care system across uh, North Cumbria and the North East. And, and it's very um, much about uh, kind of taking responsibility for yourself, but also to protect your loved ones. So it's a kind of do your bit campaign. Um, and that will include some regional promotions, media, um, advertising, and then local um, promotion as well um, in terms of the uh, local adverts, social media, um, and publications out to schools and the like. And then there is a real push across, you know, our board and our um, uh, for our staff groups to ensure that there's a, a, a targeted campaign to ensure that the uptake of flu vaccination is really high amongst our staff groups, um, including across all DC staff, Durham County Council staff this year, which where we've taken the programme further to, to kind of come alongside hopefully our NHS colleagues. So again, again, Chair, it's really for the board to champion the flu vaccination programme um, to work where we've got any particular issues in its delivery as a partnership um, in terms of any venues that are required, um, but also that, you know, to recognise that the flu board with the partnership arrangements that are in place are providing really, you know, clear coordination at this point um, and hope that we get a very, very good uptake um, in relation to flu vaccination this season. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Amanda. Just the same um, so long ago that uh, we were discussing this, and yes, it was last winter, and I know um, I was encouraging all uh, board members to go and get the uh, vaccination. I have had my flu jab. I think I was the first in the doctors to get it. Um, I took my husband along um, last week, last Saturday, half past eight appointment, and we were home at half past eight. And I've had an excellent service and I always feed the good things back. So um, I would encourage you um, 
if you can um, to make sure you get it sooner rather than later. Um, and obviously we'll be champion um, as health champions, uh, putting that message out. And I'm sure Angela, who's with us today, will be putting the same message out across the um, carers section, uh, sector that she's involved with. So thanks for that, uh, Amanda. I don't know if does anybody want to um, raise anything or if you're happy to move on. OK, we'll go on to item 12 is the local outbreak engagement board. And, and again, um, Amanda, it's over to you. Thank you, Lucy. And um, um, thank you, um, partners in the health and wellbeing board. I think in, in the pack, there are three parts to, to this part of the agenda. Um, there's the front report and we'll obviously come back to the recommendation uh, chair. And then there is the, the, the updated local outbreak control plan, and um, which was formally launched at the Health and Wellbeing Board in July. Um, and then towards the back of the papers is the, is the presentation and it's a presentation that I'll, I'll talk through this morning and obviously colleagues and will have that in the pack and the papers are available online. Um, and really what I wanted to update you on this morning um, is, to, uh, is both the work of, of the board, the Health Protection Assurance Board, which reports into this board, but also I suppose to give the current picture um, and obviously some of the, you know, the concerns that we are now feeling in relation to the rising number of cases and our rates in County Durham. So since the board, the, the board was launched, um, the plan was launched in July, we've progressed the, the um, implementation of that plan. So we remember we have um, a range of settings um, as part of our Health Protection Assurance Board and as part of the local outbreak control plan that includes the healthcare settings, schools, community, workplaces. We have now um, the university is a dedicated part of our Health um, Protection Assurance Board um, as well. So that gives a, a, an idea of the key settings and places um, and partners who we are working with. Um, each of those uh, groups have got a, um, their own small team that are developing the kind of standard operating procedures, very much focused on some of the prevention work um, to try and prevent um, the, the spread of, of COVID, but also to be ready um, to be able to respond um, if they uh, have positive cases, working very closely with, with colleagues in, in Public Health England. Um, we have uh, developed a communication toolkit across each of those groups so that we are providing um, consistent communications and that is developing all of the time in, in relation to ensuring that the messages are, are understood um, and we're getting those messages out particularly to, to communities. And we've got lo agreed local processes for schools um, informing a local authority of suspected suspected cases. And I'll come back to some of the work that's, that has been taking uh, place in relation to schools slightly later in the presentation because a vast amount of work has taken place. We've also um, produced an engagement um, strategy and action plan and, and towards the end I'll talk about the community champions because I think building on I think what's been really lovely this morning is hearing that thread of that well-being approach and actually doing things with our communities and rather than to our communities and I think that's really challenging in a pandemic when there is a lot of, of national direction and guidance that comes out and, and is expected to be implemented so taking our communities with us particularly in this next phase where we've seen restrictions lift and then they've changed um, and we knew we were going to see increasing cases. So taking our communities with us is absolutely critical in this in this next part. Um, we've just developed a response to the CONTAIN framework, which was published in July by the government and the escalation um, part of that um, uh, in, in, in in terms of the different stages of that escalation process um, whereby you may find yourself on the government's kind of area um, of concern up to area of intervention and we have seen obviously some of our uh, other local authorities across the northeast start to tip into the, those kind of areas of escalation um, and obviously it may be that um, the uh, northeast becomes part of that as a collective and we've obviously um, 
responded to cases and to clusters and I, I'll, I'll go through some of those um, current cases and clusters um, when uh, and slightly later in, in the presentation. And I think one thing that's really important that we've continued to engage nationally to ensure that up to date data we will not we're not receiving the full data. So we've certainly um, engaged nationally in relation to that. During this period, we've also seen that um, Public Health England will be going, undergoing a major organisational change and uh, Councillor Hovels did write on behalf of the Health and Wellbeing Board to raise concerns about that um, and to actively ask for um, engagement in the design of the new um, National Institute of Health Protection. Um, Councillor Hovels has also written in relation to, to testing and is, is drafting a, another letter because of problems in relation to testing. So we are very actively, um, you know, um, raising concerns at a national level. We have a, a wide range, just, just moving on in terms of some of the underpinning, we've just talk, talked about wellbeing and I think communication is another underpinning element of the of the local outbreak control plan. And what we've done is we've obviously um, communicated in a variety of ways. So um, using social media, some demographic targeting, we've done uh, local and partner channels. We're starting to look at the, the local COVID uh, champions. And they'll not be the, the COVID marshals that were announced on the, on the news last night. We want these to be doing people at a, at a local level who are the really, really understand their local communities. We've got toolkits for um, all of the range of settings, we continue with lessons learned and we produce specific materials. So an example of that would be for a Gypsy Roma traveller community and direct engagement <laughs> with our community. Um, with the professionals who work on a day by day basis, but some of the materials that can be really clear and easy to understand. And then when we have had dedicated and specific outbreaks, we've also have targeted advice, particularly in relation to self isolation and, and when to get a, a test, um, providing letters and materials to those affected wider community messaging with fantastic response from local community partners um, and obviously being quite proactive with media um, and, and uh, press press coverage um, and engagement with, with the community. And in the pack you will see obviously some examples of, of those materials and they're being honed and developed, developed all, all of the time. Um, in terms of the data, um, we're monitoring um, cases and our data on a daily basis. I think we're very fortunate in County Durham that we have a very strong um, performance and intelligence team um, and they've developed some fantastic tools to enable us to monitor um, the, the data and the cases um, on a daily on a daily basis. Um, the materials that are there show us at our, as our rate is 10.2, um, seven day rate per 100,000, which was on the 7th and the 26th of August. Um, I have to report that that has increased and we are now at 19.9 um, seven day rate per 100,000. So we are still quite a lot lower than some of the other local authorities across the northeast, but we are concerned at this increase in uh, the rates across County Durham. Um, and I think that's something that was my tone this morning. It, this is something that we really, really do now need to take very seriously once once again, um, as, as we did in the early days of, of COVID. Um, and as I say, we have seen um, increases across other other areas. In, in terms of I suppose at the moment, in terms of those increases, we aren't seeing them translate into a real, a huge increase in hospital admissions. However, again, with our partners in health, we're, we are monitoring that very closely. Um, and, and in terms of both hospital admissions and in terms of deaths, we're obviously looking at those very, very closely. Um, in terms of outbreaks, um, I guess just to, to update, um, over the last few weeks, we've um, very actively um, worked with Public Health England on outbreak control teams in relation to an outbreak in the Stanley area of County Durham, which had an association with a, a social club there. Um, that is now thankfully drawing drawing to a close. Um, again, there was a really, really strong community response to that, um, seeking people to um, self-isolate um, if they'd been at the club on, on days that um, where people were in their infectious period. We're doing some very 
active work with social clubs now to support them to think about the, the measures and um, that they need to take and looking at ex good examples across County Durham because we have also had an outbreak which you may have seen on the news um, at the earlier part of this week in Burnside and um, a social club following a charity football match and while those 60 odd cases are predominantly in uh, residents within Sunderland, we really want to work closely with those in County Durham and we're, we're working very closely with Sunderland Public Health and Public Health England again to think about where transmission is taking place, but also um, where events are happening that they are, are carried out safely. And obviously we, we'll be seeing how, how the new um, government guidance of um, the, the, the rule of six is implemented from, from Monday. We've also been working with Concert Working Men's Club on a on an outbreak there, and and I have to say over the course of this week we've seen a quite a significant um in, increase in, in cases, and some of those are small household cases, um and we've obviously seen our schools go back uh, this week, and I have to say across all of the settings there's been a huge amount of work, but. Certainly schools um, or early years settings and schools have carried out such a great amount of work in terms of the prevention and being prepared for going back to school. Um, however, I think regardless of that, I think when it when it's come down to having, you know, a possible a suspected case or a possible case or parents raising concerns. So this week, colleagues in education, public health have, and public health England have dealt with it, over 100 inquiries um, and we've probably got about six, six, six cases across County Durham um, that we're actively working with, providing advice to schools. Again, they've worked really, really hard in terms of their bubble sizes, changing the layout of schools, and it's really important that our children are back in education. So it's very really good to see that work is taking place, and we we want to to maintain that. And we've also seen um, some small. Uh, clusters in workplaces and single cases in bars and some bars have closed voluntarily to do a clean and then reopen. Um, we've also seen a slight increase in the same area of, of County Durham and again that has been addressed working with uh, colleagues and, and the local community. So quite a lot in terms of kind of outbreaks and I think we are now thinking about there is quite a lot of transmission in uh, the community setting so it's back to that message of actually it could be any one of us and it's how everyone protects each other um in terms of in terms of coronavirus um in terms of mobile testing units and um, there's been a lot of coverage this week in, in relation to the national testing and the kind of constraints on testing um, and we are feeling that locally we have had a really strong response in county durham through our nhs to provide and uh, testing for for staff and for patients, um, but obviously our mobile testing is there for the wider wider community, um, and we have had some movement of the mobile testing units, and um, because of that national um, cons constraint, uh, again we've raised that nationally, um, and we we seek to have. Um, mobile testing units very close to enable access to local people to have tests when they have symptoms and um, we're working very closely with Durham University to look at the students returning um, and ensure access both for students but also for local local residents. Um, we've done a lot of engagement with venues and, and that will continue particularly with, with social clubs, pubs and restaurants, working very closely with um, environmental health officers and also linking with colleagues in the police um, for, for that as well. And then a lot of our work feeds in at, at a regional um, area. So to a regional oversight group, which uh, Terry Collins, the chief exec from County Durham, um, is uh, chairs that group and um, part of that group is being the chair of the directors of public health across the northeast. And it's got representation of children's and adult services um, and, and the NHS, um, which which is great. So I think, again, that's our link into the, the joint biosecurity centre um, and what is happening in government. So uh, that regional oversight group has, again, fed concerns up, but has looked at good practice, lessons learned, sharing those rapidly um, and ensuring that we can we can pick up on 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 that um, response as quickly as possible. Our community response, as I say, is, is really important. And I think this part, as it is the engagement board, I think it's, it is really important to set out that this is how we, we, we do really need to engage with, with our communities and, and with the community champion programme that I'm coming on to is going to be part, part of that. Um, and we'll continue with that, that lessons learned. Um, 
there's obviously been a lot of coverage of kind of local lockdowns and certainly as we see colleagues across the northeast and um, move into those escalation and um, parts of the contained framework with government and um, there there are potential restrictions being looked at in other parts of the north in other parts of the northeast as part of our contained framework again we have worked with their uh, colleagues within environment he mental health and the corporate team in durham county council to look at what our escalation framework would look like um, and any decision orders that would need to be taken taken place if we wanted to restrict or close uh, particular venues or places over and above what, what we would be doing now, because the work to date has been very much done um, voluntarily and that is really, really important. And then finally, I think that, you know, building on, I think, obviously what Kat said, and I guess in response to the the real inequalities that I think we've seen in terms of COVID is the Community Champions Programme, and this is very much building on what we've seen right throughout the pandemic um, and ensuring that we can have a community champions program that can help to continue the support from our community hope for those people who need to self-isolate but who also can be a champion in their community who can have a little bit of training on the on the kind of facts and figures the the signs and symptoms to have that conversation um, but also to then feed um, information back to us because actually the early information from local communities um, will probably be quicker than what we will what we will see through traditional routes so that community champions program is in development um, and will utilize obviously we'll, we'll share that information out through this board um, as we look to engage um, with all of our community partners it's been developed in conjunction with them and it will help i think to to think about community champions within school within our businesses um, and our businesses have um been really responsive as well obviously again huge amounts of work taking place but having those community champions right across our different groups and settings i think will will help us to maintain that focus of doing it with people and rather doing it to people um chair i think i know there are some um, the, the recommendation is to note the report um, and I know obviously that we have received some questions from the public as well and obviously open to questions from, from board members. Um, so back, back to you, Chair. Thank, Thank you. you, Amanda. Very detailed and obviously highlights um, the work that's been undertaken, but also you've demonstrated just how communities are stepping up as well to the plate and um, being very um, proactive in delivering on the ground, working with ourselves as, as um, lead authorities in whether that be health authority or, or the council. Um, Alwyn, did you want to have a question? And then I'll open it up. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, just, just a few comments really to add to, to what uh, Amanda has been saying. I mean, first of all, um, going back to uh, just to mention again <clears throat> the letter which you wrote to um, the Secretary of State um, regarding um, the uh, Public Health England uh, issue and, and I thank you for that and I think that should be noted because it is an issue uh, during a pandemic like this that uh, makes us all very anxious I think and, and um, secondly um, I, I just want to thank the whole of the public health team in terms of the amount of work that has gone into all of this as we see is quite extraordinary it is not an easy task and we know that and i think that um has to be acknowledged in i mean this is a this is a night and day ongoing issue that you never know what's going to happen next we just don't know and and i think it's been um, quite remarkable how um, Amanda and her team have responded to this um, so quickly um, to keep the confidence of the residents in our county. Um, you would expect me to mention schools, I think, um, and, and I do want to say as well that on that one, the education team have worked extremely hard with um, Amanda and her team on uh, putting out um, information to schools. Um, it has been virtually, well, I know it's been every week, if not every other day in, in effect, that schools have been receiving information from Richard Crane, the head of education and skills around 
uh, the safety issues and what to do and schools were getting ready in August. They were working to to ensure that having all children back was going to be as safe and as risk free as they could possibly make it. Um, so I want to note as well that the work of schools of, of head teachers and their staff has also been remarkable. I'm sorry if I'm using the same adjectives. It's really difficult to find ones that <clears throat> that are different to to um, stress the work that's been carried out. But schools, although there are some, there are issues around schools and we know that and Amanda has has already mentioned them. It isn't for want of the schools actually putting everything they can into place. Um, prior to opening, during um, the school day, after the school day, um, it's all ongoing. So I just wanted to note that chair and to 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 record, you know, the thanks for extraordinary work in I know extraordinary times. Thank you. Thanks for them co comments. Um, the, I just want to pick up about the letter because it was important to write, and that's the second letter we've wrote off. But it's important that. Um, people uh, around the board are aware um, because as chair uh, I did take um, the time um, to, to ensure where that letter went off but I didn't do it in isolation I did it um, in conjunction um, with um, Stuart Finley and I did circulate it around all board members and the next letter that goes it'll be done in the same way um, and I think it's important that we do make our voices heard um, and I do feel um, the the public health team have had a very raw deal um, throughout this process. Um, and let's not forget they are the experts. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm the layperson, um, but um, the expertise uh, and what they've been able and um, to activate and to do um, and motivate uh, others along the way. Um, you're absolutely right. The public health team um, have been burning the, the oil at both ends. Um, it's been not a, a day job. It's been um, at, at any time of day or night, because I've had some um, conversations with Amanda really late on the night and um, first thing on the morning. Um, and I know how extremely difficult it's been. You can only do the job if you've got the tools and the resources. And the problem with what we've been trying to do is um, being difficult because things have changed on a daily basis. Um, guidelines from the centre has changed and the um, the resources in some parts of the country may be may be there, but the northeast, and I'm speaking on behalf of the northeast here, um, have um, deprivation, poverty. Um, we know how the health of the population is. We hear it all all the time, and people were having to travel down to London and up to Scotland to get that test. And a lot of people have found it extremely difficult and I know because people have told me and I will continue as chair of this board to listen to what people say and respond. And if organisations around this room have um, similar problems or they have concerns, I'm happy and, and to lead from the front and, and to move them forward. And I can do do that in, in this role and I'll do it um, in conjunction uh, with others and not on, on, not on my own. So um, I, I, again, um, open it up for questions. I've had my little bit say. <laughs> um, and I think Faisal had a question. Thank you, Chairman. Um, and on the back of your comments and the comments of Councillor Gunn, I'm sure I speak for the CCG when I say we extend our thanks to the system leaders and the leadership the Director of Public Health has given in what has been a generational challenge. We must not forget that, a generational challenge. And the report presented extremely comprehensive. Um, my question is, I was tempted to ask about Moonshot, but I'm not going to, but my question, um, and I'm excited about the community champions, Amanda, mm -hmm. but my question is, what intelligence do you have about a vaccine? Because I believe only when we get a vaccine on the back of the flu vaccine, will we enter the new normal. 
So that's my question, Chair, through you. Thank you, uh, Faisal Amanda. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lucy, and, and I suppose thank you to both Alwyn and Faisal for those comments about about myself and the team. And all I would say is that mm -hmm. our team can only work if they're working with other people. So the response has been, you know, across all partners and the community. So we we can only do our job if other people are willing to work with us. So, um, in terms of a, a, a vaccine, Faisal, we know obviously there's a huge amount of work taking taking place. Um, our colleagues at uh, Public Health England and NHS England are linked into the national development programme for the for the vaccine um, and the, the we are waiting for our latest update I think in relation to that and um, there is a developing framework in place for the potential delivery of that vaccine but we don't have any clear date at this moment in time um, and what I can do is obviously seek what the latest position is um, and circulate that to board members as, as soon as I have it. But certainly colleagues at the North East, um, in fact, that one of our ex-directors of Public Health and County Durham, Dr. Trisha Cresswell, was part, had actually come out of retirement to do some of the work um, on looking at the vaccine and the framework and hopefully uh, England will be at the forefront. But at this moment in time, we don't have any formal kind of um, detail in terms of the vaccine. So Thanks. sorry, Chairman, I should have said to fulfil protocol, Faisal Chastet, lay member, County Durham CCG. <laughs> Thanks, Faisal. Thanks, Amanda. We did have um, five questions come in, and um, I think the first one, I'm going to um, take Amanda. This was around the track and trace system, Amanda. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, the first question from a member of the public was that the track and trace system is in place to reduce the spread of coronavirus. What is happening to encourage local businesses to collect this information for people who use their services? Um, and I think it's really safe to say again that we've been working really closely with businesses throughout the pandemic. Um, and firstly, to help them access funding. There was a lot of um, support provided um, from County Durham to businesses um, in terms of uh, uh, funding to protect them and their staff from economic effects of coronavirus. And then also to provide advice, support and resources to help them reopen safely. So colleagues certainly within Business Durham and across the council have done a huge amount of work to work with businesses. Um, I know that all businesses have to take steps to keep their uh, workers and, and visitors um, safe by following the kind of five steps for working safely um, and then very sector specific guidance um, that, that colleagues have been working uh, with that are laid down through, through government um, and ensuring that the businesses are then kind of COVID secure um, and keeping the risks of transmission um, as low as low as possible. Obviously, we've seen the hospitality um, and service sector start to, to open up and, and see the collection of safe storage of contact details. And I think we'll see that obviously come to be a, a legal requirement as of as of Monday. Um, and that so that will be taking place. Um, engagement takes place through Business Durham um, and on a count, count, county wide basis with that advice and guidance. And certainly within the local outbreak control team plan, we've got a single point of contact through um, Joanne Waller, who's our head of community protection. Um, um, in terms of any uh, business um, associated outbreaks of coronavirus and a, a clear um, response plan in place. Um, and our approach has always been one of kind of engagement, education and, and if necessary enforcement. And obviously that does also include working with the health and safety executive um, in relation to any outbreak that is, is part of their work. Um, I think we've seen some really excellent examples of, of businesses um, to uh, to really become um, as COVID secure as possible and also to give um, very early heads up if, me if members of their staff have tested positive to keep transmission as low as possible. Um, I guess it's also an opportunity to remind everyone in terms of if, if people are contacted by NHS test and trace and um, that does mean they've been a contact and that is that need to to self isolate um, and um, that, that is the kind of key key message that we want to get a, across. Um, I suppose the other thing for 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 businesses um, and I think it, it builds on the, uh, the approach to well-being as we have um, 
launched during this uh, pandemic uh, an employee assistance programme for small and medium enterprises, um, which I think will also, and for the voluntary sector, which helps businesses in terms of their mental health and access to support for them and their staff in terms of mental health. So I hope that answers question one, Chair, um, and I'll hand on to the next question. Thank, thank you, Amanda. Um, the next one's around social distancing. And can I ask Jonathan, Dr. Jonathan Smith um, to cover this question? Thank you, Chair. Uh, the question submitted is, how can we encourage people to follow social distancing guidelines in venues, for example, restaurants, pubs and clubs? We've all got a vital role to play in protecting ourselves and our loved ones from coronavirus. In restaurants, pubs and clubs, you'll see changes to make sure that people are socially distanced, such as limiting the number of people allowed in into the venue at any given time. Tables are spaced apart, monitoring of the indoor and any outdoor space. Lots of signs reminding people about social distancing, queuing and hygiene practices. It's important for us to play our part too about adjusting to the new normal. Coronavirus hasn't gone away uh, and it's vital we don't let our guard down. We must continue to follow the government guidance and be responsible if we're going out. We're going to be with our fam family and friends. We need to help remind each other. If uh, our friends and family forget to keep their distance, we need to remind them friendly uh, in a friendly manner to, uh, to do so. And likewise, they need to remind us if we forget. Uh, it's about protecting each other. Uh, we must trust our instincts too. And if you feel uncomfortable by how many people there are in one venue, don't take a risk, go somewhere else. It's the same if someone you're with feels uncomfortable. You know, we, we've all got different points of view and we've got to respect each other's uh, different uh, different worries and uh, appreciation of risk. Thank you, Chair. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, um, Jonathan. And moving on to um, Richard Chilly. This, sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself. To Steve, um, helps from the Fire and Rescue Service. And again, this is about indoor performances. Um, people um, think the national guidance and clear. Um, if you could um, answer that for us, Steve, please. Yes, by all means, uh, Steve helps, as you mentioned, Deputy Chief Fire Officer. So the question is uh, seeking some clarity on whether uh, karaoke shows uh, can be conducted within a, a local public house. Uh, so on, on behalf of the board, um, I can confirm there's no specific government COVID-19 guidance specifically around uh, karaoke performances in public houses. However, uh, activities such as karaoke should be um, uh, conducted in line with the COVID secure guidance that the government's issued uh, because there is a high risk of transmission due to sharing of microphones and also with a potential increased volume. So I'd uh, encourage uh, those requiring further information to look at the government website specifically around guidance in working safely during COVID. On a practical level, uh, the microphones uh, should be stationary and must be within a microphone stand at all times. Uh, we'd encourage performers not to touch either the microphone or indeed the stand and uh, between users they should be uh, disinfectant and cleaned regularly. There is some guidance also on the government website around those working within the performing arts uh, and those venue operators which do clarify this further so it's encouraged to uh, disinfect regularly all uh, items of packaging, handling, uh, chairs, props, as aforementioned microphone stands and also music stands uh, and always between uh, users as well. So therefore, if a decision is taken to hold a karaoke event, um, in addition to the aforementioned um, advice around regular disinfectant of the stands and the microphone, we'd encourage people to limit the numbers within the public house and also to limit the volume through the speakers as well uh, to reduce that noise. We'd also encourage people to, uh, as the guidance indicates, consider alternatives to live music events. I hope that covers the question, Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Certainly does. Um, moves us on to um, a question to the council and Jane Robinson, can I ask you um, to address this question, please? This is around uh, council land and private land for events. Of course. Thank you, Chair. So the question was, what jurisdiction does the council have for events taking place on both their own land and also on private land? Um, and it's quite a lengthy response this because uh, clearly there's quite a lot of information, but up until the 14th of September this year, 
the current guidance from the government is that outdoor events should go ahead where they can do so safely. Many outdoor events are already permitted, provided they've carried out a thorough risk assessment and taken all reasonable steps to mitigate the risk of transmission. Where those steps have been taken, outdoor events that are organised by businesses, charitable organisations and public bodies are not restricted to 30 attendees. The new government guidance released just this week on the 9th of September um, on meeting with others safely will be fully reviewed to understand the implications on future events going ahead both on private and Durham County Council land after the 14th of September this year. Event organisers are encouraged to speak to local authorities as soon as possible to discuss plans for their events and how they can be managed safely. Councils can advise on safe working practices, support events to comply with relevant requirements and help address any concerns. This council has a well established safety advisory group which brings together representatives from the local authority, emergency services and other relevant bodies who can help advise event organisers on the safety of large events taking place within the county. An events licensing, licensing group has also been set up to look at events in County Durham during this pandemic period. The group decides collectively if events should be permitted to take place and decisions are fed back to the council's corporate management team. With the exception of large sporting events, current government guidelines allow for outdoor events that are organised by businesses, charitable organisations and public bodies to take place provided they've carried out that thorough risk assessment and taken all reasonable steps to avoid transmission. The COVID-19 secure guidance itself is not legally enforceable. However, the Health and Safety at Work Act 1974 provides a framework for considering the steps businesses should take to ensure they're operating in a way that is safe and can help to prevent the spread of COVID-19. Large outdoor events may apply for or already have an existing license under the Licensing Act 2003. In the absence of a health objective council's powers to refuse or revoke a premises license on the basis of concerns about COVID-19 may be limited as a refusal would need to relate to one of the Act's licensing objectives, which are as follows. The prevention of crime and disorder, public safety, the prevention of public nuisance and the protection of children from harm. In some cases, event organisers have applied for temporary event notices, which gives councils the opportunity to review an application for an event, although objections would still need to relate to the four licensing objectives I've just outlined. There are limited circumstances where a council can clearly refuse permission for or request organisers to cancel an event. However, the newly introduced Health Protection Regulations 2020 give county, unitary and metropolitan councils powers to restrict access or close individual premises or public outdoor spaces, as well as prohibit certain events from taking place where there is a serious or imminent threat of transmission of coronavirus. For example, a local um, spike where a large event would risk further transmission of the virus. Regulations need to be met before these directions can be issued. Therefore, they should only be issued where councils can successfully demonstrate it has met relevant criteria to resist any challenge. When considering whether this power could be applied in relation to a planned event, Councils will need to discuss with public health leads and potentially the police. The local authority as landowner is able to determine whether or not it will grant permission for an event to take place on its land and could refuse permission to allow the use of the land for an event without the need to issue a direction. Beyond this, however, the intention is that outdoor events should take place where it's safe to do so with the focus on these being supported to operate safely. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, uh, Jane. Um, very comprehensive uh, response, but it's a question that keeps being being asked as, as well from uh, local residents. Um, moves us on to uh, Richard Chilly from the Harrogate and District NH Foundation Trust, um, who I'm going to ask to to answer the 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 final question that's been brought in, and it's about um, current reported infections. 
Yes, thank you, Chair. I'm pleased to have this chance to respond to these important sort of questions from the public. So the question that was asked is to help people in this area to know the nature and extent of the local risks. Can the pub, uh, can we make public the, the postcode level information on current reported infections? Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to report that that um, on the Durham Insight there is a COVID dashboard um, and just below the sort of header is the COVID-19 surveillance. Um, that data is updated on a weekly basis and it draws from Public Health England, NHS England um, and ONS Statistics, which is the Office for National Statistics. Um, that link was uh, to the dashboard was circulated to the health and wellbeing members, but also I checked it this morning. If uh, public members Google Durham Insight, it takes you to the, the relevant site and then click on the COVID-19 uh, tab. Um, the dashboard uh, shows the number of positive COVID cases um, in a week by, and apologies for the technical term here, it's called um, middle layer output areas, which was new to me, which is, I think is a standard statistical geography of approximately about 7,200 people. So some of these MSOAs have the same name as local electoral wards and figures within within this, but the map should, should not be compared necessarily to ward data. But there's a lot of information there which people can click on, uh, can click on and look at. So cases from Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, which is the government's testing programme, are included on a weekly basis. Um, the the uh, Health and Wellbeing Board does have more up to date available to us. However, this isn't available to the public domain, so we cannot share publicly. So I hope that answers the question for the member of public. Thank you, Richard. Thanks very much. Um, I haven't been notified of any other um, questions. Um, moves us on to item 13. Any other business from any board member? Haven't been notified of any. Can I just thank everybody for the contribution and for the work that you're undertaken on behalf of the residents um, across the county. And thanks very much for presenting today. And with that, I shall close the meeting.